Hi Booktube and welcome to a new video. This is Recent Reads for Six Books. My Red Heaven by Lance Olsen. Talismano by Tunisian author uh, Abdelwahab Medeb, translated by Jane Kuntz. Gilbert Sorrentino, Imaginative Qualities of Actual Things. And Jeff Bursey's Unidentified Man at Left of Photo, Canadian author. And then two poetry books, uh, Eat or We Both Starve, by uh, Irish poet uh, Victoria Kenefick. And Dion Brand, Canadian poet, Inventory. So I'm going to start with the novels. So, My Red Heaven by Lance Olsen. So I was alerted to Lance Olsen, who wasn't someone I'd come across before, by Paperbird, and I'll post the link to his review of this book. And uh, one of the things that attracted uh, me to it was Paperbird mentioned it as Marxonian, i.e. a la David Markson, uh, who is my favourite author, so I'm all in. And I have to say, having read this, that I'm all in for Olsen as well. I've already ordered his upcoming book that's out next month, and I've... Um, made a mark of uh, some of his other books. So I can see exactly why Paper said this was Marksonian. Uh, we're referring to David Markson's late works, which are called the shoebox uh, novels, where um, Markson collected lots of sayings and quotes from people throughout history of, in every sphere of politics, sport, art, music, everything. And it's his skillful arrangement uh, of that, because he didn't do any rewriting. It was his skillful arrangement of these things that the thematic uh, elements of his book came out. This is slightly different. First of all, it's uh, very specific in its geography. It's set in interwar Berlin um, between the, you know, the disastrous end of the First World War and the rise of the Nazis. And it is much more... Um, it's not collected sayings, although it is based on real people. Uh, but some of the writing in here is is superb. Um, so it also uh, reminded me quite a lot of uh, Benjamin Labatut's When We Cease to Understand the World, which is long listed for one of the prizes a couple of years ago. I can't remember which one, Booker or Booker International. Um, this... Uh, looks at five or six scientists and increasingly uh, after a very sort of um, non-fiction start uh, gets increasingly more and more fictional as it sort of um, represents the, the thinking of these extraordinary thinkers including Werner Heisenberg who is in here. So anyone who sort of was anyone who passed through uh, Berlin in the interwar years uh, appears in here and each uh, section sort of hands on to the next with a character from the previous one or an event or a scene from the previous one, such as uh, a guy with a dancing bear or a car crash. Um, so that might be passed on rather than the characters. Uh, and who do we who do we have? We have um, actors like Marlena Dietrich, uh, Greta Garbo. We have uh, an actor whose name I can't remember who was very uh, sort of sympathetic to, to the Nazi regime. We have Walter Benjamin. We have Bertolt Brecht. We have um, Otto Dieks, the painter, which this book starts out with him and his drug-addicted um, model, Muse. Um, and it's just a whole, a whole panoply of characters. Most of them are well-known creative people, not, not every single one. So you get the real sense of the febrile creative atmosphere of, Ber of interwar Berlin, but also obviously the, the repression that is just around the corner to stamp all of that out. Um, and I just wanted to sort of, as I say, give an example of some of the writing. So this is uh, a gay couple, you know, shortly before presumably they would have been rounded up and put into camps. Um, they walk arm in arm as they have walked arm in arm in every pleasant day for more than half a century. The gesture become, became reflexive long ago, a means of closing the distance between their hearts. Over the last 15 years, ever since Julius's tremors slowly began taking hold and Anton's vision slowly began emigrating, it has developed into a necessary act of shoring up against what the years have taken from them, which I think is a, a poignant, profound statement of long-term relationship and how that is gradually decaying, you know, the decaying body of both. And yet these two, 
you know, persist through that. You know, their love holds strong. And unfortunately, although it's never stated in the book, you know, we know what their likely fates are going to be were they, you know, to live long enough. Um, and again, just to, some of the concepts behind this are just, are just wonderful. So this is about uh, two uh, beer delivery drivers in their truck and they're distracted by the man leading the bear. Heinz's attention pivots back to the boulevard. At the same instant, the wet thunk arrives. He hits the brakes and slams forward into the steering wheel, bracing himself for the impact that has already taken place. And then a bit later, when we're... I think this is Walter Benjamins, it goes, uh, who also... An old truck, advertis, advertisement for a brewery across its side, has run up onto the kerb in front of the Adlon. Several empty barrels have burst on the sidewalk. A smartly dressed man is splayed in the street, pedestrians vectoring in. When he raises his head, everything already exists in another tense. So both of those, you can see how uh, Olsen is playing with time, where bracing himself the impact that has already taken place, so our reflex is already after the event, and equally... Uh, when Benjamin looks up from his writing by the sound of the crash outside, when he raises his head, everything already exists in another tense. It's already happened. So I just think the writing and the ideas, but also the portrayal, you know, I love Markson and the portrayal of the real life characters here. You know, they're not overlong. They're not full biographies. They're, they're tasters. They're snippets in the same way as Markson's is. And he talks about um, a painter called Hannah Hoch, who was a, a Dadaist. And um, when she was young, she turned around to her father and said, when I grow up, I want to be an artist. And the father turns around to her and says, well, you can't be both. It's not possible to be both. I.e., if you're an artist, you can't be a grown up. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, if she really said that or whether it's Olsen's invention, but it, it's brilliant. Um, we also had the last director of the Bauhaus. He gets a section. Of course, the Bauhaus was closed down by the Nazis etc etc wonderful stuff five stars and on to talismano um i mentioned before that i'm highly uh, drawn to uh, literature from tunisia and algeria and this did absolutely everything i wanted it to do really uh, it gave such a flavor even though i think it was written from paris it gave such a flavor of that part of the world um and it's it's in three parts and uh, the hub of it, which is a bit fever dream like, is uh, a revolution in part of Tunisia, in the working class part of Tunisia. And this was long before the Arab Spring. This was written in the 80s, so before the Arab Spring, before ISIS, before Al Qaeda. But it is a battle for the heart and soul of, of uh, Islam within uh, Tunisia, as portrayed here. So uh, a group of uh, sort of down, sort of downtrodden people in, in the city of Tunis, led by uh, Hawes. Uh, mock, uh, sort of mock up um, this effigy out of a bit sort of Frankenstein monster, like out of bits of flesh of people from the cemetery, and a sorceress um, sort of, you know, cast her spells on it, and they're going to take this to the mosque, which obviously would be utterly defiling, and that is the heart of this novel. But it, it sort of radiates off in all sorts of different directions of historical Tunisia, modern Tunisia. Um, also, the author's recollections of other cities that he's been to, obviously Paris and in Morocco and, and other places. And I say it's a battle for the heart of, of Islam because it seems to to portray the message of, you know, this the, these you know sorcery is you know sort of paganistic, and, you know, it doesn't fit in with Islam, um, and this whole sort of. Um, Frankenstein monster obviously is, is completely heretical and paganism, you know, because it's using uh, elements of the dead, which are always sort of profane. Um, and the author, so that so the, these sort of revolutionary forces, up, forces of uprising, are sort of arguing over their, you know, the nature of their revolution. And you know, behind the sorceress is is sort of this pagan movement, you know, to wipe, obliterate. Um, not only the, the political classes, but also the religious classes, versus some slightly more um, saner voices that say, well, no, you know, if you go back to, to the Islam of, of the Moors, you know, think of what was, what you know, Islam is not sort of anti-ideas and anti-progress. If you think of all the ideas that were generated in astrology, you know, Aristotle and, and Plato were, were 
you know, sort of preserved and reintroduced back into the West via the, you know, the Moors. Um, science, mathematics, you know, all these sorts of things came under sort of Islamic auspices. And, you know, so that whole thing of Al-Qaeda and ISIS wanting to revert back to a sort of fundamental medieval form of Islam. And they're saying, well, actually, that wasn't, um, you know, necessarily this sort of back to, you know, year zero, wipe everything out. It also, it rather, it was a very creative and stimulating and gentle. You know, there's a lot of Sufism Islam here, which of course the fundamentalists have no truck with. So I, you know, I thought it represented all these different viewpoints in a terrific way. It also talked quite a lot about sort of writing and the nature of creativity and where that comes from. I loved it. It can be a bit heavy going at times because, as I say, it's a bit fever dreamish and you really have to concentrate in places because it, it you know, it's sort of, you can lose your way, you can lose focus. But I loved it. Five stars. And on to imaginative qualities of actual things, a novel by Gilbert Sorrentino, which is looking to satirise the bohemian artistic um, community of New York, uh, I assume in the 60s. Um, but it's so crassly done. It's, it's just... I asked myself what, what Sorrentino was trying to do. He dresses it up in a postmodern guise in that he tells you that this is fiction, that none of these characters are real, none of them could step off the page into real life. They're purely his creations and they're what he admits they're one dimensional, which makes it, you know, hard reading because they're so unsatisfying as characters. You know, imaginative qualities of actual things. He wants to satirise a real thing, which is the artistic community. And he, and he does it through these imaginative qualities from his head, creating these characters, creating these stories. But he himself says that, you know, these are so patently paper thin and, and superficial. So in his own words, this is, one of my great problems with Anton Harley is that I can't make up enough terrible stories about him to make him totally unreal, absolutely fleshless and one dimensional, lifeless as my other characters are. I'm afraid that the reader may get the idea that some monster like that, uh, like this, actually walks the earth. I assure them that although there are people who try to be Harleys, they can't quite make it. I'll do my best to make him totally unbelievable. I saw him on Second Avenue the other day, popping out of the Victory Delicatessen, but he, of course, looked the other way, since he had two francs in his hand. He appeared the usual way, i.e. as if he was about to bite the wall. It was seeing him that made me realise that I had to really stir this prose around to make sure that he doesn't walk around in this book with any degree of reality. That is, his reality. I want him to walk around in this book with my reality. Fiction. Fine. And now for a brief aside. While we go back a few years to an evening when Anton visited an old college friend, married with two children, I won't give his name because he is still alive and may appear in this book, in fact, in a different guise. So again, you know, he has real targets, but he's disguising them, which any novelist would do. But he's saying he's disguising them in the most unbelievable, one-dimensional way. You know, that doesn't work as a dynamic. It really doesn't. And his point is, apparently, that he put the brandy away, looked at her panties, holding them against the light. He showered, masturbated with soap, put again in his mind in the shower with him, then went to bed. Now... Go ahead, tell me these people are weird. This is my America. Simply to say stay simply to stay sane is an achievement. Well, that's all well and good, but it's it's got to be rooted in something. It can't be caricature and pastiche, because that is, as I say, one dimensional, paper thin, hollow, no meat to it, which which undermines his own argument of whatever he wants to attack. I just thought this was so poor. One of the characters is a glutton, can't stop eating. One of the characters is a sex maniac. One of the characters is an alcoholic. Yeah, it's just dreadful. Two stars. And, you know, I've reviewed this before, but, uh, of course, it's the inestimable David Marks. This is his early work. This is his sort of paid-for commissions rather than his own sort of writing what he chose to write. Um, this is called Epitaph for a Tramp and Epitaph for a Death Beat. It's set in the 50s rather than the 60s, but it's doing a similar thing to this in that it's um, satirising uh, the newly developing bohemia of New York in the 50s. But it's so much wittier, it has so much more 
affection for its characters that you know it's just so much more you know you you can you can take it from Markson in a way you just can't take it from Sorrentino anyway uh, on to uh, Jeff Busey's uh, Bursey sorry unidentified man that left a photo which in a way has a similar tack to the Sorrentino uh, in that the author is commenting on the fictive nature of the characters he creates but he has far more investment and love for his characters so that we the reader do than Sorrentino does. I would say that this was published by Corona Samizat who published my own book and Jeff Bursey and I too have very similar uh, concerns and interests in, in, in our writing uh, including even the bizarre coincidence that in this book and in my own current book Death of the Author in Triplicate we both refer to the Bad Sex in Writing Award. Um, uh, so uh, Jeff sent me, you know, asked me if I would review it and sent me this. So this has been provided by the author. Uh, he has been very uh, keen to stress that I am to review this good, bad or indifferent and not hold back. But Jeff, uh, I enjoyed it. As I say, not the least because uh, you and I sort of cross over, I feel, in our approach to literature. So it starts off with four characters uh, out of six that eventually are in the book. And these characters are talking to each other about what they've observed or what they've uh, overheard. And what they're doing is what we all do. They're telling stories. They're re relaying anecdotes of what happened in their day. Um, and yet, Bercy is underlining that these have all sprung from his own imagination as characters. Yes, maybe the conversations are things that Bercy himself has noted, but he has worked them in a fictive manner. He's given them into the mouths of characters who are fictive. Um, and it's the whole book really is an investigation into, well, we have this everyday thing called talking, storytelling, narrative, um, anecdotes. We all do it. So what does that leave an artist to do if they're reproducing that in a novel? But we're not reproducing it. We're we're not recreating. We may use material that we've gathered, but we're not recreating. We are creating. This is something anew, something afresh, and this is the value that art gives. Um, so from the mundane and from the human, um, we get something called art or literature or fiction, which is a, a different slant in, in, you know, maybe helping us understand the world, maybe not. So I just wanted to give some examples. Um, so again, like Sorrentino, he's talking about that these characters are fictive, they never existed. Um, what can I say? Apparently characters don't write themselves, despite what some writers maintain. I left two chapters open for them and came back to find nothing. Even headed the chapter so they wouldn't have to face that terrifying blank page. Pa! End of another myth. Before we get into that, it would be amusing to give some idea of the lives they lived, singly and jointly. This does interrupt the so-called narrative flow, but as is blindingly clear, what an expression, by now, this whole book is dilatory. It's loiterature, sorry, it's loiterature. There's no dramatic tension or story arc, no characters, there is no unreal telescope. You're sitting somewhere quite removed from Sea Town, which is in Prince Edward Island in Canada, or maybe in your own space in that very city, angrily convinced that the narrator knows nothing about the islanders. And already, that L and D and others are writing indignant and likely grammatically poor protest letters to the Daily Bleater about the gross maligning and shaky geographical knowledge exhibited herein. So, Bercy, I think, lives in Prince Edward Island. He has an uh, appreciation of, of the landscape and the landmarks, and they are suggested in here. But he's acutely aware that, first of all, there are uh, a literary version of these places for artistic purposes. And second, that anyone, any other citizen in uh, Prince Edward Island probably has a completely different view. So the landmarks might be the same, but the interpretation and the significance of them can be utterly different. And that is the, the, the thing that writers are always you know, juggling with in, in their fiction, that I think I mean it in this one specific way, but any reader can come with their own value system and say, no, it's not like that. You've got that totally wrong, or it's, it's you know, this is how it, how it is. So this book is constantly uh, sort of reflexively interrogating itself and interrogating the nature of fiction. Um, 
And uh, finally, um, how do you respond to this quote from Curtis White's monstrous possibility that, quote, realism has become a state fiction, a part of the machinery of the political state? Further, that it is through the conventions of realism that the state explains to its citizens the relationship between ourselves and nature, economics, politics and their own sexuality. Would you disagree? Compare and contrast. Throw up your hands. Write an angry letter to the publisher demanding an explanation of how this is considered a novel. Of how is this considered a novel? Do you think realism induces resignation to the world supposedly as it is? And that resignation is more useful to authority than someone's belief, because once belief goes, disloyalty follows. So I think that's a really fundamental, crucial concept to the type of fiction uh, that Jeff writes, that I write, that David Markson writes, uh, that Gilbert Sorrentino probably intends but fails miserably, um, where he goes, you know, write an angry letter to the publisher demanding an explanation of how this is considered a novel. So, you know, because of the Victorian novel, we have certain preconceptions of novels using Aristotle's poetics that have a beginning, a middle and an end. And there's a journey of the character or character arc and that the character moves through a series of events and is a changed and different person uh, by the end of it from how they started it. And of course, the 20th and 21st century novel is not is not, you know, doesn't adhere to that or, or you know, lots of novels do, but it doesn't have to adhere from it. And that therefore readers expecting a conventional novel will go, well, this isn't a novel. But as David Markson told us and explained in This Is Not A Novel, that it absolutely is and anything could be a novel, really. Um, so in that section, Bercy is, is, is describing very real life um, ideas and the nature of power, you know, it is through the conventions of realism that the state explains to its citizens the relationship between themselves and nature, economics, politics and their own sexuality. So that, you know, this is uh, a, a sort of um, a hyper realism. We think it's, you know, an objective, neutral reality that we look out of our bedroom window. But no, it's all been interpreted for us, back to us, through films and news articles and TV and, and everything. So there's a huge sort of political dynamic at work or a power dynamic at work here, which is a very real thing that we need to grasp and grapple with in our daily lives. But is a novel, how does a novel get us to do that? Because boldly stated there, Curtis White, you know, I've read a lot of Curtis White's fiction, but he also writes a lot of non-fiction. Um, so I haven't read Monstrous Possibility. I assume it's non-fiction. So White has made this argument in a non-fiction way. It's picked up in a novel, in a work of fiction, and is trying to grapple with it to say to the reader, look, have you considered this? Are you aware of this? And even the act of reading has been, you know, we've been taught how to read. We've been taught how inter to interpret it at school and maybe at university if you studied English literature. You know, nothing is neutral. Nothing is uh, objective. You know, it's all sort of inflected and, and tinged. And how does a novel deal with that? Can a novel deal with real life ideas when it's fiction? If so, how? How does it do without being preachy? Just setting, you know, slamming the words on the page? No, it has to be embedded organically um, in the nature of the novel, you know, through through its characters. Bursley says that, you know, uh, one of the bits I read earlier, that there are no characters in this novel. There are, there's about six and, and lots of other satellite characters. But it's not a novel where we are following their arc of their journeys, or we are to a limited extent, but it's not about their moral improvement or their moral degradation leading to, uh, you know, uh, a, a terrible ending, as you get in the Victorian novels. So, you know, I think this is super sophisticated and I really enjoyed it. Five stars. And on to the two works of poetry. So this is Eat or We Both Starve, my first uh, poetry book by uh, Victoria Kennefick, Irish uh, poet. And this is every aspect of eating, you know, the, used symbolically and imagistically. So we have obviously Catholic communion, we have cannibalism, we have nourishment, um, we have vegetarianism, we have um, bulimia and anorexia, but all symbolically done, not, you know, not a, a sort of one-to-one... -one correlation with reality there's a brilliant poem called second family which is literally you know where the uh the poet's voice is um 
is talking about becoming part of a blended family of a, a, of a remarried. What if I were to tell you my mother stepped into that space left by another, like her mother before her, like a question mark, curved like that? Am I wicked too? Nasty half-sister with grabby hands? I cracked the glass slipper. I didn't mean to, though I am always stealing. I squander my life like coins. Our maternal line starving. We still eat apples. We are immune. I never heard my father say her name. I wrote it down instead, swallowed the paper like a host. Even now I flinch if I hear it on the radio, read it in a book, meet someone with it on them like a wine stain. I love her because I am here. So that poem, which is an extended poem in several sections, I, I just think is brilliant. And uh, I'll give you another quick... This is called Meat. This is the voice of someone uh, why she became a vegetarian. I sucked marrow from bones at dinner, my father's face a bloody grin of pride. I ate liver in chunks for breakfast, pink and firm, jewels to adorn my insides. I gloried in the feel of flesh, the exertion of the chew, holding my mother's hand in the English market. I saw them, turkey chandeliers, plucked, bruised purple eyelids, dainty light bulbs, their smell fresh as the insides of my mouth. Mother stroked my hair, there, there. I refused to eat meat, became pillowy, meek. She hid muscle under mashed potato. I tasted its tang in soup. Eat up, my parents said. I could not swallow. My skin, goose pimple yellow, doctors drew blood in tiny, regular sips. Teeth turned to glass and shattered in my mouth. All I could taste was blood. I just think some of the internal uh, assonance in that is, is fantastic. But I, I just think, you know, the extended uh, imagery of... of um, chandelier turkey chandeliers eyelids dainty light bulbs um wonderful stuff five stars i'm going to check out some more of her poetry i think and on to dion brand inventory so dion brand wrote one of my favorite ever books called the blue clark clerk i don't know if it's poetry i don't know if it's prose part i don't know what that is but it's wonderful this is much more straightforward poetry i think it's it's a it's, the whole book is a poem it's called Infantry because it's a sort of poetic consideration of the early, uh, the first decade of, of, the, of the 21st century and things like, you know, obviously 9-11, the invasion of Iraq, uh, all these, I think also uh, possibly Yugoslavia, I can't remember now. Um, and and it's, it's, you know, Dion Brand is a great, is a great poet. But I particularly like this. Um, there are no titles, there's just sort of numbered sections. So this starts off being about 9-11 and then is about the sort of the daily grind of New York. It was not coincidence then that the day was beautiful, the highways roaring, the sky that blue which is deeply ordinary and infinite. Perhaps in this city she was distracted for a few seconds by the open blinds, the living room's clarity, the kitchen's decisions. She thought then of going, going somewhere. The six lanes hummed, scratched under the wheel. The windows of houses going by blinked, vacant through the speed and noise. Machine and body, shield and tissue, the highway worked itself into her shoulders and neck. Now she was trembling, tasting all the materials the city stuffs in its belly. I mean, I love that last paragraph about, you know, how the sensation of the road sort of invades her, you know, worked itself into her shoulders and neck. Now she was trembling tasting all the materials the city stuffs in its belly wonderful stuff five stars so as you can see a really good reading week apart from gilbert sorrentino the red heaven my red heaven five stars talismano five stars gilbert sorrentino two stars unidentified person that left a photo five stars kenneth fleck uh eat or we eat or we both star five stars and inventory five stars so what a great reading, a uh, couple of weeks actually, rather than one week. And as to what I'm currently reading, I'm reading Laurie Moore's new novel, uh, I Am Homeless, This Is My... If I Am Home... Sorry, I Am Homeless, If This Is Not My Home. I've never read Laurie Moore before, I'm about halfway through it, and I'm loving it. And I'm really looking forward to getting to this. This was uh, Eric Carl Anderson, uh, spoke about this book. He very much loved it, sold me on it. Biography of X by Catherine Lacey. Now, normally I wouldn't be interested in biographies, but I think this is an all-round um, subversive deconstruction of, of what we mean biography.
by biography and how you can pin any person down between the pages of a book. You know, they're so we are so multifaceted that how can a biography get to the, the gist of us? So I'm really looking forward to that. So uh, there you go, Butchu. Till next time. Thanks very much.